Welcome everyone. I'm Benjamin Bernstein with astroshaman.com and it is my great honor and privilege that uh, the Asheville Friends of Astrology is kind enough to let me do this annual forecast for them every year and uh, I'll give it my best shot this year as always. So what I will be covering today is I'll be discussing Pluto's momentous entry into Aquarius, his square to Jupiter and the lunar nodes and the decade defining mini grand trine that the wealthy one, Pluto, is forming with Uranus and Neptune. Will this harmonious aspect pattern help usher in a new era of love and light? The U.S. Pluto return is another 2023 highlight. I will dive into the potentials and perils of this four-year process, which is already transforming the country. We also have important sign changes in 2023. Saturn enters Pisces, Jupiter moves into Taurus, and the lunar nodes shift into Aries and Libra. I will also discuss the coming year's Jupiter-Chiron conjunction and an intense grand cross featuring Mars, Jupiter, Pluto, and the lunar nodes. I just want to let you know that I have done some post-production. I've edited out everything that I thought someone watching the event after the fact would not be interested in or that would not be helpful. So this is about 20 minutes shorter than the original recording, which means you'll save some time and you won't have to wait through stuff that doesn't matter past the moment of the live recording. So enjoy. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have written a book that hit number one on Amazon the first week it was out. It's called Instant Divine Assistance, Your Complete Guide to Fast and Easy Spiritual Awakening, Healing, and More. To get that on Amazon, just search for Instant Divine Assistance. It'll come right up. Uh, it's now got, I think, 55 reviews. They're all five stars, so I'm super happy that it's being well received. I now host two podcasts. The original one that I've been doing since 2005, This Week in Astrology, is where I forecast uh, twice a month. And I've got a brand new one called Awaken, Heal, and Thrive. We're up to eight episodes. It's a weekly, comes out every Tuesday. And I talk about all sorts of spiritual things. Again, it's how can you awaken? How can you heal? How can you thrive? And uh, it, I rarely touch on astrology there, but I cover all this other stuff I'm into. So you can find uh, This Week in Astrology or Awaken, Heal, and Thrive wherever you get podcasts. I also do video versions, and you can search for those on YouTube if you want. I also run an online membership called Awakening Plus, which helps its members awaken, heal, and thrive. That's where I got the name for the podcast, and that's been going for several years. And if you want some really incredible support for super little money to help you in your a process of healing and awakening and thriving, then check out awakeningplus.com for that. Um, I am a three-time Best Astrologer winner in Western North Carolina's Premier Reader Survey. I've done over 10,000 readings and sessions, uh, including my Astrology Plus Astrology Reading, Shamanic Healing, Life Coaching, uh, and that's with a global clientele. I have presented at five national astrology events, and I even wrote a chapter called Shamanic Astrology in a book called Transpersonal Astrology Explorations at the Frontier. Almost done talking about myself. <laughs> I also facilitate life transforming healings and spiritual awakenings in my individual and group sessions and I've devoted myself to over 45 years of spiritual practice. My greatest joy is helping others with my instant divine assistance invocations, which I've been giving for 11 years now to thousands of people. These simple yet potent techniques make spiritual awakening healing and more fast and easy. My spiritual path has included Vipassana Buddhism, Peruvian shamanism, ayahuasca and San Pedro plant spirit medicines and of course those Ida invocations. Okay, so that's a little about me. So now let's get into what we're into here. I'll be going more or less in chronological order, and I'm only going to hit the really important stuff, the major events that will shape the the year coming 2023 in a strong way. Um, it's in two parts. First, I'll go chronologically through the key astrological events of 2023. And then I have looked at the key lunations, the new moons, full moons, and eclipses of the year as well. And I will cover those, but I definitely want to leave time for questions at the end, no matter what. So let's jump in with um, Saturn going into Pisces. That will happen on March 7th. And I'm now going to talk about orb um, in astrology. Orb, O-R-B, is a technical word. It means how close to exact is it? So when I say the orb of something is such and such, that means not when it's exact, but you know when it's close enough to be, have the effect be felt. So the Saturn coming into Pisces um, will happen on March 7th. Now in this case, orb doesn't apply because it will it'll be absolutely in Pisces all the way through May 24th of 2025 for over two years. 
So to understand Saturn and Pisces and how we can work with that, and, and let me also mention, I'll be doing a mix here. I'll be doing some things that are about the larger effects on the world, but I'll also be putting a lot of attention to what can you do with these personally. Um, you know, a lot of people think astrology, oh, it's fate acting on you. And that's not my view at all. It's like, we are not the pawns on the chessboard. We are the chess masters moving the pieces. So um, I'll be giving you lots of ways that you can use this information to make your life better. So Saturn in Pisces, what are Saturn keywords? Mature, responsible, productive, good time management, plan the work and work the plan, the wise elder, the hermit, death, challenge, reality checks, and the phrase, the obstacle is the way. Now, what about Pisces keywords? Those are spiritual awakening, inspired creativity, flow state, dreams and visions. On the low side, Pisces can get into substance abuse, addiction, excessive escapism, aimless drifting, or playing the victim. So what are some good ways to work with Saturn coming into Pisces? Well, law of attraction and turning dreams and visions into reality is perfect for that. Saturn is physical manifestation. Pisces is visualizing and imagining. So doing any kind of law of attraction work is fantastic for that. If you're not familiar with that, it just means in a very simple way, I am getting really crystal clear in my mind about exactly what I want. Maybe I've written it down. Maybe I've created a vision board, but it's clear in my mind. I can imagine it. And I, uh, sometimes daily or however often you feel called, I imagine that as if it's already happened. And then I just hold it for a while till it feels like enough. And the idea is the universe is far from immovable material matter. It's a hologram. It's like the holodeck on Star Trek. And when you put a lot of intention into seeing something happen, you can actually call it in through your visualization. And that's how law of attraction basically works. There's lots of variations, more and more passive, more active ways to do it, but that's a, a standard procedure I've just described. So with Saturn in Pisces, that is law of attraction heaven. So you can have a lot of fun with that and call things in more effectively than you might have otherwise been able to do. What else can you do with Saturn in Pisces? Embodied awakening, my all-time favorite. In this case, Saturn is embodiment. It's in 3D and awakening, another Pisces keyword is being aware of what you are beyond your body. And uh, my belief is that we're all the entire universe and all the dimensions of consciousness. We just may not be aware of it yet. And my experience with awakening has been no matter how awake you are, there's more available. And you might, even if you feel like you're profoundly deeply awakened, you may have only gone a tiny fraction of the way to what's possible. There's actually no way to know. You can't even imagine the next awakening until you get to it. So with Saturn in Pisces, it's a great opportunity if you are called to um, become more conscious of what you are beyond just regular 3D stuff, then this energy really supports that. Also, uh, a third way to use Saturn in Pisces is conscious dissolution. Uh, this is where you have a structure, Saturn, you are done with, and you want Pisces to dissolve it like water. So if there's something you don't want, you can imagine it dissolving out or take actions to get rid of it. Uh, other ways to use Saturn in Pisces, creative accomplishment. Uh, Pisces, as I said, is creative inspiration, and that can be any of the arts. It can be creative ideas in any area of life. Saturn says, I want to make it physical and manifest where I can check it out with my five senses. So uh, creative accomplishment, bringing your inspirations, not just having them floating around in your head, but actually bringing them out into the world, making them real and doing good stuff with them. Um, now, there are some pitfalls with Saturn in Pisces. Uh, what you don't want to do is use escapism to avoid your challenges and not use an abundance of ideas as an excuse not to act on any of them. Don't get excessively isolated with Saturn as the hermit and Pisces loving its quiet space. You can overdo that too. And you don't want to repress Saturn, any of your spiritual awakening or inspired creativity. So those are Saturn in Pisces ideas. Alrighty, next up we have Jupiter conjoining Chiron, these two planets coming together in the sky. And that'll be right around 14 degrees Aries. That'll happen precisely on March 12th. And now I get to use Orb. Um, they're close enough to be in effect starting on January 7 of 2023. And they're close enough to interact energetically all the way through May 6th. So that's about four months of Jupiter and Chiron together. What can you do with these guys? Well, let's talk about what they are individually, and then we can talk about how they work together. Jupiter, um, is the biggest gas giant in the solar system. It has more keywords than any other planet. So a lot of stuff you can do with Jupiter. Uh, you can be the higher level student. You can be the professor, the philosopher, the guru, the wisdom giver. You can be joyous and exuberant and celebratory. 
you can pursue religion and philosophy and the meaning of life. You can go do foreign travel or in these days of the web connected, you can bring a lot of foreign influences and culture to you. Um, that's just some of the things you can do with Jupiter. And I haven't given you the whole list even. What about Chiron? Chiron's a lot simpler. Chiron's the wounded healer. Um, in internal work, Chiron rules shadow work, which just means you have a challenging emotion come up and instead of running from it, you turn and you face it and you use a, an effective modality to heal it ideally once and for all. The healing invocation I teach in my book, Instant Divine Assistance, is, has helped a lot of people do that. Um, externally, Chiron can manifest in two basic ways, the healer and the wisdom giver. Uh, technically, he's the mentor, but you know we go way beyond the technical definition of mentoring into the broader sense of wisdom giving. That's what Jupiter and Chiron have in common. Jupiter, again, is all this higher wisdom. Chiron's the mentor, wisdom giver. They have total synchronicity on that meaning. Um, and of course, healing, as I already mentioned. So when you put these guys together for four months, among the opportunities are amplified opportunity for receiving or giving higher wisdom, uh, expanded opportunity for healing, which is probably going to be catalyzed by the triggering of old trauma. I mean, how many of us proactively work our old wounds and traumas if we don't have to? Uh, some do, but most of us will wait until something comes up that's uncomfortable and then, oh, there it is. I guess uh, I better, I'd rather not, but I guess I have to deal with that. So when you get catalyzed during this four month period, use an effective shadow work tool, whether it's my healing invocation or whatever works for you. Um, good time to do that. And these planets will support that healing uh, more than would normally be the case. Also in uh, sexual healing is good here because these planets are in Aries, which is a sign of sexual energy. So it's a no brainer that sexual healing would be a good thing to do if that's appropriate. Also, you can heal excessive aggression if you tend to have anger management problems or you tend to be snappy. Uh, this energy can help you heal and be less reactive in that way. Uh, what you want to watch out for with Jupiter and Chiron together in Aries is unrestrained attacks that result in any kind of wounding, physical or psychological. Don't be the attacker and, uh, and keep your distance from people who might attack you. So those are some ways to work with that. All right, next we get the big one, the one I'm gonna spend more time on than any others, Pluto coming into Aquarius. Why is it such a big deal? Well, the slower a planet is and the farther away, the more impact it has, strangely enough. That's because they spend a lot more time doing something and the outer planets are transpersonal. They're called the gods of change and they have an incredible energetic impact. So when an outer planet changes signs, it's like major headline news in astrology. So, so let's talk about Pluto coming to Aquarius. The first time it happens in 2023 is on March 23rd, and he'll be in Aquarius March 23rd through June 11th. And I'll just give you the timeline here. He's going to do this for 20 years. <laughs> so in brief, he, he's there through June 11th of 2023. Then he retrogrades back into Capricorn for seven months. Then he's back in Aquarius. January 20 through August 31 of 2024, then back into Capricorn one last time for two and a half months, and then he locks in. He'll be in Aquarius November 19 of 2024 through, through March 8th of 2043. That's 18 and a half years solid, and that means he'll be there for about 20 years since the first time he popped in. So it's going to be a long-term play, um, and as if that wasn't enough, uh, the energy of Aquarius will be amplified by his aspect to Uranus at the same time. Let me explain something about astrology. Um, astrology works with 12 basic archetypes, and there's three ways to access an archetype, not just a planet, not just a sign, even in an astrological house, I can find those energies. We're not gonna get into houses tonight. But um, again, the, the energy of Aquarius and the planet Uranus have exactly the same keywords. It just so happens that as Pluto enters Aquarius, he has already begun a trine a, a soft 120 degree aspect to the planet Uranus. And that means that, and he'll hold that for most of 10 years. Whoa. So it isn't just Pluto and Aquarius. It's also Pluto trying Uranus. And that's pretty amazing that we get 10 years of doubling down on that archetype that has to do with Aquarius and Uranus. And not only that, there's times when Pluto backs off the trine, but most of this 10 year period, if he's not trying Uranus, He's sesquare Uranus. A sesquare is a 135 degree aspect. So Pluto and Uranus are connecting virtually all the time during the first 10 years of this. 
And that's just to really amplify how powerful this all is. So again, I'm going to interpret the archetypes separately, and then we'll put them together, and then we're going to get really methodical about what this might look like. So Pluto is an archetype. Um, this is the eighth astrological archetype. Um, if you know the meaning of Scorpio, you already know the meaning of Pluto. So the Pluto archetype is death and rebirth. Pluto says, if something is not optimal, I want to help you either let it go completely or we need to transform or heal it so it's working to your better good. So that's one of the big Pluto things. Two Pluto keywords are wealth and power. Wealth obviously can be money. But in a broader sense, wealth is anything that makes your life better, anything that you value for any reason, whether it's tangible or intangible. So as Pluto comes to Aquarius, you might ask yourself, what is the wealth that I want? And be really particular and let the universe know. Um, power is another Pluto archetype. And power, forgive me, comes in two basic flavors, power over and power shared. Power over is like the dictator. Uh, you will do what I say. You're under my thumb. My goal is to hold power over you and take advantage of you and exploit you. Uh, the other power is shared power. And this is more like the power that was exercised by Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, I need to be powerful so I can give power to a lot of people. I want to share it. I want this to benefit everybody. So when you're dealing with power themes, you get to choose. Um, in the law of one channel material, which I'm a big fan of, they say the power over would be called service to self and the shared power would be called service to other. Uh, Pluto also rules all types of the occult and occult is not creepy. It literally just means hidden in astronomy. They say a planet occults another planet when it gets in front of it and hides it from view. So occult itself is a neutral word. What it means in our Pluto terms is anything to do with energies that are not visible. So, for example, occult astrology is an occult art. So is mediumship. So is being psychic. Um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, runes, um, mediumship. It's all psych uh, that kind of thing. The occult is that kind of flavor of stuff. The metaphysical arts, you might say. Dr. Strange is an occult practitioner. So those are some of the flavors of Pluto and what that can work with. I'm not saying I've given you every single one, but that gives you a pretty good sense. What about Aquarius? Uh, Aquarius has three high side ways that it can be expressed, if you want to boil it down. First, Aquarius says, are you willing to accept yourself as the unique one of a kind human that you are, even if you're weird or strange? Okay, so Aquarius says step one is can you accept what's unique and different about you without just resenting it or fighting it or wishing it wasn't so because that's just a waste of energy. Step one is I accept everything that's unique about me. And then if there's something I'm not happy with how it's functioning, now I can work to heal it or transform it possibly. But you have to first accept it before you can work with it in an efficient way. So step one is accept what's unique and different internally. And then to the degree that's appropriate, you express it to the world. Now, some people like me can fly their freak flag all the way up the pole all the time. And that's just how you are. Other people have to be more selective. There's certain people you might not want to show some of your unique qualities to. Uh, one of my mottos is before you share something with someone, ask if it would be good medicine for them. You know, if you're dealing with a super conservative person, you might not want to talk about your metaphysical stuff. Okay, so be selective about what you share, but uh, you're not ashamed of it either. You're just saying, you know what, it's not maybe the best thing to bring up right here, right now. It's not going to serve me or anyone else. So knowing when to express your uniqueness is part of the wisdom of Aquarius. So that's the one that takes the longest to talk about. The second, which I'll be referencing also in the presentation, is intuitive hits. Um, Aquarius and the associated planet Uranus are the planet that sends down the intuitive hit, the aha, the eureka, the oh, I just know. And in my experience and in querying literally hundreds of clients over the years about intuition, every single one has told me that when they get an intuition and they follow it, things go better than if they don't. If they override it with their intellect, things don't go as well. And how do you know if it's a real intuition? Well, the, the best phrases that get to this is something pops in, you say, oh, I know it in my whole body. I know it in my bones. I know it in my gut. Your body, there's a physical resonance that says, yes, that's right. Whether it's a suggested call to action or whether it's a bit of information that came in. Uh, if you don't get that, then it's not intuition. And that's the, the 
everyone I talk to about it agrees with what I just said. Beyond that, there's other things that might indicate it, but they're not universal. So that's intuition. And when you're dealing with Aquarius and the associated planet Uranus, you want to be attentive to that. Okay, the final level of Aquarius, the highest is uh, serving others with your special gifts and talents, your uniqueness that you most love to use. Not just any kind of service, but the service that you're especially gifted at and you really love to do it. So those would be the three levels of Aquarius. In summary, accept what's unique within yourself, express that uniqueness to the world as appropriate, follow your intuitive hits, and serve others using your special gifts that you most love to use. So when you put them together, you get big change now. Now what's interesting with Pluto and Aquarius and making these nearly constant connections to the planet Uranus, it's a little bit like the 60s. Uh, back in the 1960s, the planets Pluto and Uranus were together uh, very strongly in the middle of the decade, and they were in orb uh, everywhere from like 1960 to 1972. That's why that was such a crazy decade all over the world. And we had Uranus and Pluto square in the mid 2010s. And you might remember how intense and radical those decades were in their own way. So now we have them together again, double, again, Pluto in Aquarius and aspecting Uranus. And so once again, it's a time for big change now. And a lot of you're going to be seeing a lot in the world because of that. And some of that will be beyond your control, but you can choose in your own life, what big change do you want in yourself? Uh, Uranus says we can have the change fast. Pluto says we can make the change profound and life transforming. So it's up to you what you choose. Now, I say that, and yet, if your higher self says, you know what, it's time to get this on board, then things may happen to you and change may happen whether you like it or not. And then it's a matter of realizing what's going to really serve your highest good, even if there's initial resistance and getting on board with that. So that's just a little bit about how we can work with Pluto and Aquarius as separate energies and a, a very basic way of how we can put those together. All right, now let's get into a little more historical things so we can get a sense of what might be happening in the larger world as this happens. Um, one standard method astrologers use to understand something is what was going on in the world the last time this happened. And as it turns out, uh, Pluto takes about 250 years to come back into a sign. And I'm going to go back two repetitions. I'm going to go back to when Pluto was in Aquarius in the 1500s and in the 1700s and see, is there a commonality we can draw from those times and draw it on what we might expect as Pluto comes into Aquarius this time? So I'm not going to spend too long on the historical stuff, but I think it's an interesting perspective. I have, I went deep into Wikipedia and then I whittled it down. <laughs> okay. So Pluto was in Aquarius from 1532 to 1552, that 20 year period. This was during the Protestant Reformation and early in the English Reformation. The English Reformation actually started three years before Pluto came into Aquarius in 1529. I'm going to break this down by um, category. The first category is religion and politics, which were totally enmeshed at that time. The Reformation is usually considered to have started with the publication of the 95 Theses by Martin Luther in 1517 when Pluto was in Capricorn. The Reformation's ending date is disputed, although many place it in the mid 1600s. It took over 100 years. The Reformation, alternatively named the Protestant Reformation or the European Reformation, was a major movement within Western Christianity in Europe that posed a religious and political challenge to the Catholic Church and in particular to papal authority arising from what were perceived to be errors, abuses, and discrepancies by the Catholic Church. The Reformation was the start of Protestantism and the split of the Western Church into Protestantism and what is now the Roman Catholic Church. It's also considered to be one of the events that signified the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the early modern period in Europe. So here are some important things that happened during this Pluto and Aquarius period. The English Parliament banned payments by the English Church to Rome. The English Reformation Parliament passed the Act of Supremacy, establishing Henry VIII as supreme head of the Church of England. Pope Paul III excommunicated Henry VIII from the Roman Catholic Church. The first complete English language Bible was printed. That was a big deal. The Council of Trent opened in Northern Italy. It was the 19th Ecumenical Council of the Catholic Church. It was prompted by the Protestant Reformation and has been described as the embodiment of the Counter-Reformation. The Council issued condemnations of what it defined to be heresies committed by proponents of Protestantism and also issued key statements and clarifications of the Church's doctrine and teachings. 
and the Act of Uniformity imposed the Protestant Book of Common Prayer on England. So there was conflict between the political and religious authorities. I think you can find some resonance there to our own time. In the arts, two significant things. Um, you may have heard of a book called The Prince by Machiavelli, how to use power uh, to get what you want ruthlessly. That was published during this period. And artistically, Michelangelo was made the chief architect of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. There was also a really big deal in science, uh, and it was a total game changer. Copernicus published the book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, offering mathematical arguments for the existence of the heliocentric universe and denying the geocentric model. This was heresy at the time. And um, it took a while to clock in, but that was a major shift. Uh, not quite as famous, but also important. Andreas Vesalius published On the Fabric of the Human Body, which revolutionized the science of human anatomy. And what some would say was the most important thing of all, chocolate was introduced to Europe. <laughs> so what we see here in the 1500s period of Pluto and Aquarius, breakthroughs in ingenuity in religion, politics, and the arts and sciences. Next, we'll look at the most recent Pluto and Aquarius period before the current one. 1777 to 1798. First category, politics and individual rights. Here we had the American Revolutionary War, the Articles of Confederation, and the United States Constitution. Pretty major stuff. Following that, the French Revolution, which bred the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, is proclaimed in France. And not to be outdone, then there was the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and of the Female Citizen, also published in France. That was followed up by A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft, one of the earliest works of feminist literature published in London. So a lot of game-changing stuff there. Then on the scientific front, a big deal, especially for astrologers, Sir William Herschel discovered the planet Uranus, which was the first of the outer planets to be discovered. And some synchronicity, here's Pluto in the sign of Aquarius. And what's being discovered is Uranus, which is now considered the modern ruling planet of the sign Aquarius. Good synchronicity. Then in philosophy, a big deal also, Immanuel Kant published his Critique of Pure Reason, which has exerted an enduring influence on Western philosophy. The book is considered a culmination of several centuries of early modern philosophy and an inauguration of modern philosophy. So a major work of philosophy coming in this time of Aquarius. And in the arts, Mozart wrote most of his best known works when Pluto was an Aquarius and a book called Lyrical Ballads with a few other poems, a collection of poems by William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge was first published in 1798, right near the end of this period, and is generally considered to have marked the beginning of the English Romantic movement in literature. It became and remains a landmark, changing the course of English literature and poetry. And in technology, another big deal, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, revolutionizing the cotton industry in the U.S., but also leading to the growth of slavery in the American South. Whitney's gin made cotton farming more profitable, so plantation owners expanded their plantations and used more enslaved people to pick the cotton. The invention has thus been identified as an inadvertent contributing factor to the outbreak of the American Civil War. And one miscellaneous note, also with Pluto in Aquarius during this time, Louis XVI of France signed a law that a handkerchief must be square. So, once again, big breakthroughs in ingenuity, this time in politics, individual liberties, science, philosophy, the arts, and technology. However, the handkerchief remained in a lamentable state of repression. So that's history. Now, we're going to come to our time. What I'm going to do right now, Pluto is still in Capricorn as I give this lecture in November of 2022. So what I'm going to do is break it down by themes. I'm going to talk about what has happened during the 15 or so years that Pluto has been in Capricorn and then project what might happen in those areas as Pluto moves into Aquarius. So let's start with finance. So while Pluto was in Capricorn, and let me just mention, I've only brought out themes that are relevant to Pluto being in Aquarius, not just everything that's ever happened. So Pluto rules wealth and power while Capricorn rules large organizations. That sounds like finance to me. 
So while Pluto was in Capricorn, we had the subprime mortgage crisis, including Lehman Brothers bankruptcy filing, Merrill Lynch's acquisition by Bank of America, and AIG's unprecedented request for short-term financing from the Federal Reserve. President Bush signed an emergency law creating a $700 billion treasury fund to purchase failing bank assets. And before I forget, let me mention almost everything I'm getting here is out of Wikipedia. Uh, there is one place, one bit of information that isn't, but I'll identify that when it comes along. Also with Pluto and Capricorn, the Icelandic government and banking system collapsed. Several Eurozone countries required bailouts, including Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. The G7 agreed on a global minimum corporate tax rate of 15% intended to prevent tax avoidance by some of the world's biggest multinationals. Bitcoin and blockchain began, and El Salvador became the first country in the world to accept Bitcoin as an official currency. Unfortunately for El Salvador and many others, in November 2022, the month I'm giving this, the cryptocurrency market crashed due to the sudden collapse of FTX, which had been considered one of the most stable and reliable crypto exchanges. Lots coming out as I give this lecture on the uh, shady shenanigans that were going on at that company. So as Pluto enters Aquarius, the theme of wealth could suffer from unpredictability and sharp spikes up and down. Technology could generate great wealth or as we've just seen, could decimate it. So take intuitive hits seriously in the area of finance. Don't invest stuff you can't afford to lose. Let me tell you a quick story. The most, um, the most powerful intuition I ever got, which I stupidly ignored. This was, I believe, 2007, just before the big financial crash. I wake up in the middle of the night and it's the only time in my life my intuition was screaming at me and it said, sell your stocks now. And I was so shocked by this. It was so out of character that I, I kind of froze and didn't. I wasn't at a point in my life yet where I trusted my intuition like I do now. And I didn't, and I sure enough sold them three days later after I'd lost $30,000 in value and I was not a millionaire or anything. So to me, 30,000 was a lot of money to lose because I wasn't smart enough to follow my intuition. Let me just add in here, uh, we're in a time now where the truth is very hard to come by. You can find people on total opposite sides of a question and you go on the internet, you can find reams of evidence that'll support either side. And in that kind of thing where it's hard to find a definitive authority anymore, there's no more Walter Cronkite giving us the news as it is, you have to, in my opinion, follow your intuition. My understanding is your higher self always knows what's best for your human self, and it will be giving you hints. And if you can get access to that inner guidance, I have yet to see it fail. And I've learned the pain of not following it, as I gave in the story I just gave you. Okay. Let's move on now to the theme of politics. Um, politics, of course, has to do with power structures, Pluto and Capricorn. So Barack Obama, the first black US president, was elected and then reelected with Pluto and Capricorn. The Arab Spring protests caused governmental change in countries, including Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Syria. The Occupy Wall Street protests began in the US and spread to 82 countries. Cuba and the US reestablished full diplomatic relations, ending 54 years of hostility. The Russian government used computer hacking to interfere with the US election process. Donald Trump was elected president in a surprise victory over Hillary Clinton, and he survived two impeachments, becoming the first US president to be impeached twice. Britain did its Brexit, withdrawing from the European Union. The leaders of China and Russia changed their country's laws to possibly set themselves up as leaders for life. Protests erupted in Iran following the death of Masa Amini in the custody of the country's morality police. And amid a government crisis, Rishi Sunak became prime minister of the UK following the resignation of Liz Truss the previous week, resulting in a 50-day tenure, the shortest ever for a British prime minister. And just recently, the Democrats retained control of the US Senate in the 2022 midterm elections, and the Republicans gained only marginal control of the House instead of benefiting from the red wave that had been widely predicted. Most Republican candidates who claimed that the 2020 election had been stolen and were endorsed by Trump were defeated. Because of this poor electoral showing, although Trump is once again running for president, it's unclear how much support he'll get from conservative media and other politicians. Now, we're gonna take a deep dive into a report from the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, I'll just call them International IDEA from now on. 
This is an intergovernmental organization that works to support and strengthen democratic institutions and processes around the world in order to develop sustainable, effective, and legitimate democracies. It has regional offices in Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, Caribbean Asia, and the Pacific and Africa, and West Asia. The organization is headquartered in Stockholm, Sweden, and is an official United Nations observer. My sense is these people have good credibility. According to International IDEA, many democratic governments are increasingly adopting authoritarian tactics accentuated by the COVID-19 pandemic, while autocratic regimes are consolidating their power. The world is becoming more authoritarian as autocratic regimes become ever more brazen in their repression. Many democratic governments are backsliding and are adopting authoritarian tactics by restricting free speech and weakening the rule of law, a trend exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. These are the key findings of the International IDEA report titled The Global State of a Democracy Report 2021, Building Resilience in a Pandemic Era. This report is about a year old, but it's the most recent one they've done. And it still feels current to me. So International IDEA says, quote, the Global State of Democracy report is not a wake-up call, it's an alarm bell. Authoritarianism advances in every corner of the earth. Universal values, the pillars of civilization that protect the most vulnerable are under threat. The number of backsliding democracies has doubled in the past decade, now accounting for a quarter of the world's population. This includes established democracies, such as the United States, but also EU member states, such as Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia. More than two thirds of the world's population now live in backsliding democracies or autocratic regimes. Overall, the number of countries moving in an authoritarian direction in 2020 outnumbered those going in a democratic direction. The world has lost at least four democracies in the last two years, either through flawed elections or military coups. The global state of democracy indices show that authoritarian regimes have increased their repression, with 2020 being the worst year on record. The COVID-19 pandemic has deepened the trend of democratic deterioration. As of August 2021, 64% of countries have taken an action deemed to be disproportionate, unnecessary, or illegal to curb the pandemic. And let me just jump in here. How is this relevant? Pluto in Capricorn, Pluto is power, including authoritarian uh, power over, service to self power, and Capricorn is the structures they're using to enforce it. Continuing with this report, but many democracies have proven resilient, including during the COVID-19 pandemic, by introducing or expanding democratic innovations and adapting their practices and institutions in record time. Quote, the political flaws and social fault lines revealed by the pandemic will drive more people towards populist and authoritarian leaders that seldom deliver durable solutions for the concerns of citizens, end quote, said International Idea Secretary General Kevin Casas Zamora. Quote, if there's one key message in this report, it is that this is the time for democracies to be bold, to innovate, and revitalize themselves, end quote. The report finds that many countries held credible elections in exceedingly difficult conditions created by the pandemic, often by expanding the modalities to exercise suffrage. Nonetheless, International IDEA warns against the grave and looming threat of disinformation and baseless accusations of electoral fraud, as seen in Myanmar, Peru, and the United States. One of the key findings of this research is the remarkable strength of civic activism all over the world. Pro-democracy movements have braved repression in places such as Belarus, Cuba, Eswatini, Myanmar, and Sudan, and global social movements for tackling climate change and fighting racial injustice have thrived. More than 80 countries have experienced protests and civic action of different kinds during the pandemic, despite often harsh government restrictions. To conclude, the report recommends a series of policy actions to bolster global democratic renewal by embracing more equitable and sustainable social contracts, reforming existing political institutions and shoring up defenses against democratic backsliding and authoritarianism. Now, we've, we're most of the way through this. We're going to briefly touch on each of the global regions and what's happening specifically there. And again, I'm bringing this in because it's so relevant to the Pluto in Capricorn theme and the Pluto moving into Aquarius theme. Asia and the Pacific. The continent has suffered a wave of growing authoritarianism as crises of various kinds have affected Afghanistan, Hong Kong, and Myanmar. Democratic erosion is also widespread, including in India, the Philippines, and Sri Lanka, with many of them suffering from rising ethno-nationalism and the militarization of politics. China's influence, coupled with its own deepening autocratization, also puts the legitimacy of the democratic model at risk. 
Africa and the Middle East. Recent declines in democracy in Africa have undermined remarkable progress made across the continent over the past three decades. The COVID-19 pandemic, though seemingly less damaging to public health than elsewhere in the world, has added pressure on governments to respond to concerns regarding governance, rights, and social inequality. While regular elections remain the norm, the democratic quality of these elections is on the decline and attempts to evade or remove presidential term limits present a risk to democracy. Moreover, the year has seen four successful military coups in Chad, Guinea-Conakry, Mali, and Sudan. The Middle East's tainted track record on protecting civil liberties was even further strained by the pandemic, with many elections held with the sole aim of keeping existing regimes in power, such as in Algeria, Egypt, and Syria. The Americas, that's us. Half the democracies in the region have suffered democratic erosion, including notable declines in Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, El Salvador, and the United States. Still, most democracies have been resilient to the disruptive effects of the pandemic, with most elections going ahead and parliaments, judiciaries, and media managing to exercise their functions of oversight. The Dominican Republic and Ecuador are notable for the considerable progress made in the quality of their democracies. And finally, Europe. The pandemic has placed a strain on democracy in some countries where democratic principles were already under threat. It provided an excuse for governments to weaken democracy further. Ongoing democratic backsliding intensified in EU member states Hungary and Poland, while Slovenia joined them as the region's third backsliding democracy in 2020. Europeans' non-democratic governments, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Russia, and Turkey, have intensified their already very repressive practices. And that is the end of that report. Thanks for being with me on that. I just found so much value in that that I wanted to give it to you pretty in depth. So as Pluto moves into Aquarius, you can take whatever action is available for you to preserve and promote democracy wherever you live. In the US, the surprisingly strong Democratic showing in the midterms with the simultaneous defeat of most candidates who promoted election denial is a hopeful sign that the US citizenry wants to preserve democracy here. All right, next topic, dirty laundry. <laughs> Institutional secrets and scandals is another theme of Pluto and Capricorn. WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, and others leaked damning confidential documents about the war in Afghanistan, the Iraq War, Guantanamo Bay, a U.S. government mass surveillance program, the Panama Papers, the Pandora Papers, and more. Not only that, Volkswagen was exposed as rigging diesel emissions tests, affecting an estimated 11 million of their vehicles globally. So the cat's out of the bag and information will continue to be published, alerting the public to political and corporate malfeasance. However, the tactics of obfuscation have changed with the rise of social media. Rather than repressing damaging information, the new strategy is simply to flood the infosphere with false counter narratives. Because of how social media algorithms work, inflammatory lies will always spread faster than commonly presented truth. As we've seen, many people are easily deluded and will believe almost anything if it hits the right chemicals in their body. Our challenge is to stay conscious and level-headed enough to tell the difference between truth and falsehood. As I've already said, it's especially helpful to have a strong connection to your intuitive wisdom, which I believe is any human's most reliable source of information and guidance. Another Pluto and Capricorn theme, big physical structures. The tallest man-made structure to date, the Burj Khalifa, Khalifa in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, opened. Switzerland's Gotthard-based tunnel, the world's longest and deepest railway tunnel, opened following two decades of construction work and moving in the other direction. A major fire engulfed Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris during Holy Week, resulting in the roof and main spire collapsing. Again, all that happened during Pluto and Capricorn. Who knows what massive structures we'll experience during Pluto and Aquarius. In my fantasies, maybe they'll start finally working on that space elevator. <laughs> Next topic, internet and tech. This relates to Pluto and Capricorn and this stuff, transformation, wealth, control, and big business. Among the highlights while Pluto was in Capricorn, the augmented reality mobile game Pokemon Go was released, breaking numerous records in terms of sales and revenue. Computers around the world were hit by a large-scale WannaCry ransomware cyber attack, which went on to affect at least 150 countries. Sadly, ransomware attacks have now become commonplace and are increasing. 
I think I just read that about a quarter of all businesses have now been hit by a ransomware attack, and it's just getting more. Apple Incorporated became the world's first public company to achieve a market capitalization of $1 trillion. That is Pluto scale wealth. Elon Musk, the world's richest man, completed his $44 billion acquisition of Twitter. More on that later. Social media algorithms evolved to keep users maximally engaged by promoting inflammatory content and seducing users into groups of self-reinforcing conspiracy theorists. Meta and other big tech companies are investing billions to develop the metaverse with Pluto and Aquarius. We can expect this immersive blending of physical and virtual reality to slowly integrate into many people's daily lives, much as smartphones, once a rare luxury, have now become routine. However, we would be wise to maintain healthy in-person human relationships. For a reminder of what could go wrong, watch that brilliant movie called Her, starring Joaquin Phoenix. It's a few years old, but still totally awesome. And be careful, as I said, not to get sucked down conspiracy theory rabbit holes on social media. Next topic, terrorism and war. While Pluto was in Capricorn, Osama bin Laden, the founder and leader of Al-Qaeda, was killed during an American military operation in Pakistan. Mass shootings in the U.S. and around the world with high body counts, once met with horror and outrage, have become routine. Trump supporters attacked the United States Capitol, disrupting certification of the 2020 presidential election and forcing Congress to evacuate. Five people died in the ensuing riot. The event is classified as a domestic terrorist attack and drew international condemnation. The Taliban captured Kabul. The Afghan government surrendered to the Taliban. Soon afterward, the United States withdrew its last remaining troops from the airport, ending 20 years of operations in Afghanistan. Also, Russia invaded and annexed Crimea in 2014, and then in February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia was hit with international sanctions, but continued fighting anyway. The war has created serious international challenges with global food prices increasing to their highest level since the UN's food price index began in 1990, not to mention massive food shortages. Russia's subsequent annexation of southern and eastern Ukraine was seen as a breach of international law by the global community. Ukraine has been steadily regaining Russian-occupied territory for months, and in November 2022, shortly before this presentation, they recaptured Kherson, the only major city to be taken by Russia since the start of that war. Now, Pluto and Aquarius can manifest as large-scale violence. There were major conflicts during the last two Pluto and Aquarius periods, including the Revolutionary War and related conflicts involving France, Spain, and Great Britain, and many European military conflicts during the Reformation. If you can help resolve a conflict without using violence, this will subtly affect how conflict is handled globally. You can also influence the global energetic network by staying as peaceful as possible yourself and radiating peace, love, and light to the world. Next topic, equality. Costa Rica became the first Central American country to legalize same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court granted federal recognition to same-sex marriage in the U.S., but the new conservative majority seems as if they might be inclined to remove that recognition. With Pluto and Aquarius, the Aquarian tendency toward individual freedom and liberty makes it likely that the woke trend toward same-sex marriage and each person uniquely identifying and expressing themselves as they choose will keep spreading. Next topic, racism. While Pluto was in Capricorn, the shooting of Michael Brown, an African-American by a police officer, occurred in Ferguson, Missouri, triggering riots. The Unite the Right rally was held in Charlottesville, Virginia, by a variety of white nationalists and other far-right groups, and protests caused by the murder of George Floyd broke out across hundreds of cities in the U.S. and around the world. These were followed by further protests and rallies against racism and police brutality globally. With Pluto in Aquarius, we could see racial equality become more of a violent flashpoint or see people's attitudes positively transforming toward greater racial equality. We could all learn from Daryl Davis, a black musician who converted about 200 white racists away from the Ku Klux Klan. His technique was to sympathetically listen to them. His experience, as well as numerous psychological studies, have shown that the best way to convert someone from a toxic viewpoint is to fully hear them out without expressing judgment before making any attempt to change their mind. Any attempt to persuade them before doing this will most likely only harden their current attitude. Next, climate change and catastrophes. 
The Paris Climate Accord, while Pluto was in Capricorn, committed all countries to reducing carbon emissions for the first time. And while Pluto was in Capricorn, here are four key quotes that came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in, in the order they were given. First, rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society are needed to ensure that global warming is kept below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Next quote, the effects of human-caused climate change are now widespread, rapid, and intensifying. Third quote, many impacts are on the verge of becoming irreversible. Final quote, greenhouse gas emissions must peak by 2025 at the latest and decline 43% by 2030 in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Beyond that, at the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, world leaders agreed to a phase down of unabated coal power, a 30% cut in methane emissions by 2030, plans to halt deforestation by 2030, and increased financial support for developing countries. A series of severe heat waves from July to August 2022 hit Europe, causing at least 53,000 deaths and causing major wildfires, travel disruption, and record high temperatures in many countries. Pakistan declared a climate catastrophe in 2022 as the death toll from flooding exceeded 1,000. Pakistan experienced the world's deadliest flood since 2017. 11,000 scientists from around the world published a study in the journal Bioscience warning, quote, clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency, end quote. And then slightly different, but kind of the same. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services warned that biodiversity loss is accelerating with over a million species now threatened with extinction. The report says that the decline of the natural living world is unprecedented and largely a result of human actions. I'm going to segue right into the catastrophe section and then give my commentary. Pluto and Capricorn rules massive destruction of existing structures as one of its manifestations. While that was happening, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, one of the largest in history, prompted international debate and doubt about the practice and procedures of offshore drilling. A 7.0 magnitude earthquake occurred in Haiti, devastating the nation's capital, Port-au-Prince. Over 316,000 people died, making it one of the deadliest earthquakes on record. A 9.1 magnitude earthquake and subsequent tsunami hit the east of Japan, killing about 16,000. Tsunami warnings were issued in 50 countries and territories, and emergencies were declared at four nuclear power plants affected by the quake. Hurricane Sandy, the largest Atlantic hurricane on record, wreaked havoc, resulting in over 200 deaths and more than $68 billion in damage. Then Hurricane Harvey struck the U.S. as a Category 4 hurricane, causing catastrophic damage to the Houston metropolitan area, mostly due to record-breaking floods. There were over 100 deaths, and total damage reached $125 billion. This put Harvey in a tie with 2005's Hurricane Katrina as the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history. More recently, Hurricane Ian hit Cuba and the U.S., causing catastrophic damage to both nations. It killed over 150 people and left millions without power, including the entire nation of Cuba. There is no way around the fact that the Pluto and Aquarius ability to create shocking, radical, and widespread destruction will be increasingly with us as climate change gets more severe. As much as possible, we would all be wise to relocate away from areas that could be severely damaged or destroyed by extreme weather. This could lead to widespread relocation of climate refugees, leading to dramatic demographic changes in countries around the world. Next topic, space and rocketry. Powerful businesses made steady progress in rocketry. SpaceX landed an uncrewed Falcon 9 rocket, the first reusable rocket to successfully enter orbital space and return. Then SpaceX conducted the world's first reflight of an orbital class rocket. The first crewed flight of the SpaceX Dragon 2 launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida. The first crewed spacecraft to take off from US soil since the space shuttle retired. Several countries have landed unmanned spacecraft on Mars. Others have tried and failed. SpaceX has surrounded the Earth with Starlink satellites, which have been very helpful to the Ukrainian resistance. This makes internet access available around the world. NASA's Ingenuity helicopter, part of the Mars 2020 mission, performed the first powered flight on another planet in history. 
Blue Origin successfully conducted its first human test flight with a reusable New Shepard rocket delivering four crew members into space, including its founder, Jeff Bezos. Inspiration4, launched by SpaceX, became the first all-civilian spaceflight, carrying a four-person crew on a three-day orbit of the Earth. The James Webb Space Telescope, the successor of Hubble, transmitted its first operational images. And in November 2022, just right before this presentation, NASA conducted the first uncrewed flight of its space launch system, the largest rocket in history. The onboard Orion capsule will orbit the moon before returning to Earth as a demonstration of planned human missions. With Pluto and Aquarius, empowering transformation and innovation, expect to see plenty more breakthroughs in space technology. If you can afford it, you can even visit space yourself, just like William Shatter did. <laughs> Next topic with Pluto going into Aquarius, COVID. COVID, the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu, create, created massive challenges globally in every area of life. It is a horrific embodiment of Pluto and Capricorn, widespread death, massive breakdown of existing structures, and a powerful restructuring of our global reality. It was also accompanied by another dark Pluto and Capricorn dynamic, widespread conspiracy theories, paranoia, lies, and hoaxes, creating a new structure of false information. Whichever side you're on, there were lies told on the other side from that perspective, right? The power dynamic started as shared global challenge, but devolved to a great extent into us versus them conflict, thanks to social media. In mid-November 2022, the World Health Organization reported over 600, 630 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, including over six and a half million deaths. Almost 13 billion vaccine doses had been administered. Pluto's rulership includes huge things, as well as a huge number of small things, including viruses. I can't predict whether we're getting a lot of uh, COVID or other viruses with Pluto and Aquarius. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. If something does happen, it will probably be unique and novel, given that we're in Aquarian energy. Also under Pluto and Capricorn, we had child abuse scandals. Numerous institutions were hit with those, including the Catholic Church, the Boy Scouts, the Southern Baptist, Penn State, and USA Gymnastics. Pluto rules rape and sexual abuse, and Capricorn rules institutions. Pluto and Aquarius could bring more shocking revelations of sexual abuse, but can be used more positively to embrace your sexuality in a way that does not cause harm to anyone else and serves the highest good of all concerned. Pluto and Aquarius can also help you make breakthroughs in tantric or sacred sex, where you can experience the bliss of light body blending. This far transcends the pleasure of any physical orgasm. Next topic, wealth distribution. Six men have individually amassed more than $100 billion in personal wealth. Pluto in Capricorn has encouraged the concentration of wealth to a smaller group of people. We have more of that now than since the Gilded Age. Pluto in Aquarius, which relates to the welfare of all people, could see wealth more broadly distributed. And we are done with Pluto in Aquarius. Let's take a breath. <laughs> that is as deep as we're going to dive on anything, folks. Thanks for bearing with me. I spent a lot of time researching that. <laughs> all right. On May 16 of 2023, Jupiter enters Taurus and will stay in Taurus until May 25th of 2024. That's about a year. This will be an expansion of Taurus themes. Taurus themes include money, material possessions, the five senses and sensuality, persistence, nature immersion, just being. Uh, less helpful Taurus uh, approaches are saying, the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know, to excuse not changing. And Taurus can also bore itself to death. What about Jupiter? I've already kind of told you the Jupiter keywords uh, because I talked about that when I was talking about Sagittarius. So again, Jupiter and Sagittarius all have the same keywords. So I will not, let me think. You know what, it's been a while. So let me just hit those real quick again. Jupiter represents higher education, formal or, self, formal or self-guided as a student, the professor, philosopher, guru, or other wisdom giver, foreign cultures and countries, religion, philosophy, and the meaning of life, quests and adventures, celebration, euphoria, and enthusiasm. Uh, in a less helpful way, Jupiter can be overextending yourself and thinking you have the one true way, you're right, everyone else is wrong, and you turn into sort of a street corner preacher. So with Jupiter in Taurus, 
you can exercise practical idealism, higher education with practical applications, euphoric sensuality, and again, be cautious about getting stuck in overextension or thinking you have the one true way. Then on May 17, we have Jupiter square Pluto. Jupiter is at zero Taurus and Pluto is at zero Aquarius. The orb is from April 5th to July 2nd. Then that square will reoccur again from November 20th, 2023 to the end of February, 2024. Although it's not quite as close on the second round. So what can you do with Jupiter square Pluto? You can have amplified power for good or ill, increased wealth, boosted sexuality, including that awesome soul blended sex I was talking about, religious empowerment, the ability to do or overdo more, enthusiasm or fanaticism, life transforming insights, amplified power to serve others, increased wealth used to benefit others, increased sexual pleasure, the possibility of foreign wars, increased passion for higher learning, more energy for quests and adventures, and epic celebration, euphoria, and enthusiasm. Next up, we have an aspect pattern. Okay, so that's called a grand cross. We have Mars at the bottom, Jupiter and the North node on the left, Pluto on the top, and the South node on the right. So this will be in effect from May 9th uh, through June 6th. And again, it's strongest on May 23rd. This can give you massive power to act in alignment with your life purpose, possibly as a leader or entertainer, since Mars is in the sign of Leo. This can give you an unusual ability to persist with all planets and points in fixed signs. The persistence can lead to major breakthroughs since Pluto is in Aquarius. And those are the key things to know about that. The next thing up is um, Jupiter conjoining the North Node on June 1st, but that's kind of contained in here. So it's just an amplification of moving towards your life purpose in summary. Then uh, Pluto is going to come back into Capricorn on June 11th. And then we have our next thing I want to show you, which is Jupiter sextile Saturn. This is exact on June 19th. And um, Jupiter is at around seven Taurus, Saturn's around seven Pisces. It's in orb from May 7 to July 31st uh, for starters. And then it comes back into orb uh, mid-November 2023 through early May of 2024. Um, so it, it's going to be with us a while. What do we do with it? You can use this for a lively and harmonious balance of expansion and contraction because uh, Jupiter's expansion and Saturn's contraction. Jupiter is in Taurus and Saturn's in Pisces. So this makes it great for law of attraction, embodied awakening, and conscious dissolution, themes I discussed previously. Then just a quick note on June 26, Mars square Uranus. And these two in square are pretty intense. It's a kind of volatile. So in late June, just be cautious. Don't do crazy dangerous things. Stay away from things that might be volatile or people who might be dangerous. But it's incredibly good for acting Mars on your intuitive hits, Uranus. Then on July 17, the nodes change signs. Now, the, the weird thing about the lunar nodes is they move backwards. Now, I use true node calculation. There's more than one way to calculate what they're doing. And they kind of, they kind of two steps back, one step forward, but basically they're pretty consistently moving backward. Uh, all the other planets are moving forward and it takes them about 19 years to go all the way around. So every year and a half, they change sides. So here we have the North node coming into Aries and the South node coming into Libra on July 17. And they'll be there through uh, January 11 of 2025. How can you use this? Uh, find an appropriate balance between self Aries and others Libra. Uh, practice enlightened selfishness. If you are too much of a doormat and you're just kind of doing what other people want you to do, uh, take your own needs and desires into account. Um, if a relationship will not allow that, ask yourself, do I really want to continue that relationship? Um, it can help you to assertively promote your creativity. And this is a good energy with South Node Libra, North Node Aries to proactively initiate relationships instead of waiting to be asked to dance. Uh, Aries is the path of the warrior, entrepreneur, initiator, or sexual being. And with that South Node in consideration, doing this while maintaining harmony, balance, and consideration for others.
Next up, we have Pluto square the nodes. So this is exact on July 23rd. And uh, as this happens precisely, Pluto's around 29 Capricorn and the nodes are around 29 Aries and Libra. This lasts about a year. It comes into orb uh, January 31 of 2023 and, and lasts until January 13 of 2024. And basically this is just Pluto really empowering the whole lunar node idea. To me, the key message here is make whatever changes or transformations are needed to align with your life purpose. Next up, we have a kite. Now, what's a kite? Okay, so if you look at it, it, it looks like an old fashioned kite, doesn't it? Um, so what you have here is the, tr the big equilateral triangle is called a grand trine. And then the, the dashed lines going to the top make a kite point and that's what makes it a kite. So what we have here is Mars on the grand trine, Mars at the bottom, Uranus on the left, Pluto on the right, and then Neptune's up there at the top. The kite comes into orb on August 9th, it's exact on August 20th, and it ends on September 1st. I'm going to think of this in terms of the outer planets affecting Mars. Now, typically in an aspect pattern like this, uh, one would normally give emphasis to the planet at the tip of the kite, which is where Neptune is. But there is another astrological principle that says if you've got only one personal planet combined with slower planets, you want to interpret in terms of the personal planet being affected by the others. And that to me makes more sense right here. Um, so here I'm going to think of Mars um, receiving harmonious empowerment of you acting with Mars themes, including the warrior, entrepreneur, leader, or sexual being. Mars is in Virgo, and that empowers service, health, and attention to detail. Now, Mars is sending some energy the other way, but I want to wait till I get to that little mini grand trine on its own before I get into that. Next up, a T-square. So this T-square has Mars and the south node at the bottom, Pluto on the right, and the north node at the top. It's exact on August 6th, and um, it started on September 23rd and goes through October 19th. If this looks a little bit familiar, this is that grand cross we looked at earlier just without Jupiter. And um, what you can use this one for is passionate, assertive action toward your life purpose. You can dive into shadow work to heal your old wounds and traumas so you can move forward unburdened. And you can work to develop new or partially developed gifts and talents. Where am I pulling that from? Well, the south node down here, let me explain the nodes briefly in, in general. In astrology, we say the south node is where you're coming from and the north node is where you're going to. In this illustration, the south node is the horseshoe with the opening at the top and the north node is the horseshoe with the opening at the bottom. So the south node contains two basic things. My premise is that we humans each have a higher self or soul and this soul actually does a lot of work before you incarnate to set up the lifetime. It hangs out with the soul, but I say, you take that, you be my best friend, you be the one who challenges me, and they kind of work this all out. If you want to read an amazing book that describes how this all works, Journey of Souls by Michael Newton is the best book I've found on how a soul prepares for the next lifetime. The guy is a hypnotherapist. He regressed people back to their life between lives after they had died from the previous incarnation before they came into this one. And all these people didn't know each other and they all told really similar stories and it makes for this amazing read on what all happens. So the South Node has two flavors of stuff in there. One is the soul getting ready says, okay, uh, to prepare for this particular incarnation, I'm gonna cherry pick certain gifts and talents from prior lives and I'll bring those in and they're on time release. Over time, uh, my human self will discover or more deeply develop these certain gifts and talents mm -hmm. and also I'm going to cherry pick some of the old wounds and traumas that were left over from prior lifetimes. They didn't get healed all the way. And let's bring some of those in. And with any luck, we'll get those healed this time around. So I don't have to carry those forward. So the South node is both the gifts and talents as well as the shadow work that needs to be done. That's the idea there. Next, we're going to go to that mini grand trine I'm so excited about. Now, for those of you who saw my presentation last year, when I forecasted 2022, I spent about 20 minutes on this. Uh, rather than talk about myself, I had Eric Myers, that wonderful astrologer and a good friend of mine, uh, do a presentation on it as a guest presenter. I'm not going to go into it as much depth this time. I'll just give you more highlights. So first, what is a mini grand trine? It is a trine, which is that 120 degree 
connection between Pluto at the bottom and Uranus at the top. And they're making sextiles, these little 60 degree connections to Neptune. So uh, a regular grand trine would be what I showed you earlier, the big old equilateral triangle. This is called a minor aspect pattern, but when you got all three outer planets engaged, it becomes kind of a big deal. So this mini grand trine is gonna pretty much run through the rest of the decade. It's uh, in this year, they will be in orbit of each other, close enough to form the mini grand trine from May 31st to January 1 of 2024. And then later in 2024, it locks in for good and it runs for like four and a half years. And it gets especially strong in like 2024, 2025, 2026. Um, what makes it even more powerful is all the players change signs and to have all these guys moving into um, air and fire signs is even more powerful. Now I'm getting ahead of myself though, so one thing at a time. So when you have soft aspects like this in astrology, when you see blue connectors, at least in solar fire, but the software I use, that's a harmonious, more easy aspect pattern connecting more easily. So here we have the three outer planets considered the gods of change, the transpersonal forces connecting harmoniously. And this to me is a tremendous opportunity for the earth to enter more deeply into the Aquarian age of love, light, and peacefulness. So in this instance, the hope is that we will cultivate the higher qualities of these three planets and use them for our collective benefit. What are the higher qualities? Well, Pluto would be shared power. We all empower each other and lift each other up. We embrace occult practices that are helpful and productive, like, you know, astrology or learning to work with subtle energies in a way that's really powerful and helpful. Um, to all step into our wealth, our collective wealth, wealth that's extracted in a way or used in a way that doesn't damage the earth or anyone else. Um, sharing power, wealth, um, all of us willing to do our shadow work. Pluto is the shadow work master. He's Lord of the underworld where we bury all that stuff and say, oh, let me show you how to, how to face those old wounds and traumas and work with them skillfully. And every time we do, we uncover gold. And when we heal that stuff, the gifts and talents and sparkle that was being drowned out by the wound is now released and we get to have it back. In shamanic terms, it's like we do a soul retrieval. We have part of us that got wounded and kind of scared off and it's kind of floating off on a string and it's not helping us at all. We can unburden it, bring it back and reintegrate it. And now we're a more whole being with more capability. In IFS, internal family systems therapy, which I also do, um, we say we go to a part that is burdened, we unburden it and we reintegrate it, which is just exactly the same thing as a shamanic soul retrieval. So that's some good things you can do with Pluto. Uranus, I've already given you his high sides. To recap, you can embody what's unique and special about you as a human. You can share with others as appropriate. You can follow your intuitive hits. You can serve others using your special gifts and talents you most love to use. With Neptune, I've already given you his keywords too. You, as I, I think I gave them in the context of Pisces. You can awaken spiritually. You can receive your divine inspiration. You can operate in flow state or in the zone. You can work with dreams and imagery and, and all that. And all the planets empower each other, you know, all mutually reinforcing and empowering and giving each other special energy all the way around that little mini grand try. So that would be a lovely way to use it. Now, can we guarantee that it will only be used on the high side? Absolutely not. Each of these planets, even with soft aspects, can go low and we can have people dominating and being violent with each other. We can have craziness and chaos. We can have addiction and substance abuse and escapism. And all those things are available with that mini grand trine as well. And um, my question to you is, what do you want more of? You know, um, understand that it may seem like things are beyond your control, but we are all part of what the Hindus call Indra's web. We are all knitted together. We're all part of that butterfly effect you may have heard about. Any one of us who shifts consciousness radiates that consciousness to all other beings on the planet and beyond that too. But let's just talk about the planet. So if you think you don't make a difference, you make a difference just by being here and holding a particular consciousness, whether you're intending or not. And people who awaken, who actually connect with their divinity and are really intentional about sending out higher vibration energy, they are far more powerful than people who are just unconsciously doing their thing. One powerfully awakened person can have greater impact than hundreds of unawakened people. So 
I would recommend if you want to have this more beautiful world, then get busy uh, awakening your own consciousness the best you can and go into the high side of what this mini grand trine is trying to do. So that's what I would recommend. That is all of the sky aspects. Now we're on to the Pluto return. This is the last big one. Um, and then I'll just flip through a bunch of uh, lunations real quick, and then we'll leave, we will have some time for questions at the end. All right. So now you're looking at um, the chart of the United States of America. Um, this is the most commonly used chart. There are different ideas about what is the U.S. chart, but the one I'm using is July 4, 1776, 5, 10 p.m., Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And you might ask, what is a Pluto return? Okay, so there's two Plutos there. The one on the inside um, is the natal Pluto of the U.S., and I've drawn this chart for December 28, 2022, and that is the third and final exact hit of transiting Pluto landing on top of natal Pluto. And um, it takes 250 years for a Pluto return to happen. Humans don't have them, countries do. And when you look at what happens when a country gets a Pluto return, that country transforms in a significant way just about every time. And as I said, the US is already transforming. We had the Capitol, we had the January 6 riots. Um, we had the biggest threat to our democracy since the Civil War. We have a more divided populace than we've ever had since that time. And things are changing and getting intense. So uh, this is the sort of thing that is not uncommon in a Pluto return. So um, uh, just to be technical about it, all three of the exact Pluto returns for the U.S. happened in 2022 or will happen. We had one on February 21st. There was another one on July 11. And the final one, again, is on December 28, 2022. The orb of the Pluto return is about four years. It came into effect on March 13 of 2020, and will feel its effects through mid-December of 2024. Um, what about the Pluto keywords? I've given those to you already, but I will remind you. Uh, Pluto is power, wealth, transformation, death and rebirth, occult practices, things like that. We can expect continued transformation in the U.S. Where we go is up to us. And I personally was very encouraged, as I've already said. It was a big surprise that the Democrats retained control of the Senate and that the Republicans gained control of the House by a very slim margin. All the votes are not in, but it's not the red wave, as I said, that people were expecting. And to me, there were two key factors that were part of that, according to the political analysis I've heard. Uh, one was... Um, a lot of people perceive democracy to be under threat. A lot of the uh, Republicans who were running, again, were election deniers, and most of those did not get elected. Um, and also abortion, having been, you know, Roe v. Wade struck down by the Supreme Court was a big deal. And a lot of people were voting in response to that, according to the polling of after they voted. So um, to me, there's hope. We're still under threat of, of our rights being taken away and a democracy being weakened. Again, that report I gave from that, you know, place out of Stockholm that was looking at the whole world, they noted several times the U.S. is in trouble. Our democracy is weakening. So an objective observer had that opinion about it. So what I'm going to do now is get into some of the things that have happened while the U.S. has had its Pluto return. And, um, some of these I've already touched on in my prior discussion of Pluto and Capricorn. If so, I'll blow right by them. There's some that are new, and I'll go into those a little more deeply. So while we've been under the Pluto return, we've had the U.S. as a political battleground for racism and police brutality, including the George Floyd protests. We had Donald Trump's final full year as president, his first impeachment trial. We had his appointment of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. That, along with his other appointments, definitely turned the court in a more conservative direction. Trump lost the 2020 election, but he claimed his victory was stolen. Vice President Kamala Harris made history as the first female, Black, and South Asian vice president. Trump tried to overturn the 2020 election results throughout the year. We had, of course, the January 6th insurrection and Trump's second impeachment, the first time that's ever happened to a U.S. president. We had lots of protests against COVID-19 lockdowns. 
other protests, mostly against police brutality. We had that extremely active Atlantic hurricane season and a destructive California wildfire season in 2021. Then this year, as I record this, 2022, as I present this, uh, there were culture wars in the US, including around critical race theory and the teaching of gender identity in schools. As I said, Roe v. Wade was overturned, ongoing investigations into Trump and the January 6th attack. We've had a global inflation serve, repeated Federal Reserve interest rate hikes, a stock market decline, increased gasoline prices. A lot of this was at least catalyzed in part by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We've had huge layoffs at America's largest tech companies. They've all cut at least 10% of their workforce. Um, historically, Ketanji Brown Jackson was the first black woman confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. Uh, the Supreme Court in its new conservative configuration ruled that New York's restrictions on carrying a firearm in public violated the Second Amendment. And they said, you can't restrict that. The Supreme Court also ruled that the Environmental Protection Agency is limited in its capacity to regulate power plants carbon emissions. Hurricane Ian, which I mentioned earlier, became the deadliest hurricane to hit the US since Hurricane Katrina. And to be more specific about those mass shootings, there have been 587 of them in 2022 including the one in Evalde, Texas, at least that's the number through November 7, and 27 of those took place in schools. We had the cryptocurrency collapse uh, that I mentioned earlier. Elon Musk's actions after purchasing Twitter have resulted in rampant chaos and confusion. He has fired about half the workforce and is putting down pretty draconian rules about people if they want to stay. Uh, I already mentioned about the Democrats and the midterm voting uh, stuff. There's nothing new there. Um, so that's what you get with a Pluto return. <laughs> so now you get to ask, why do we work with power? As I said, um, Pluto is power. Uh, as the law of one defines it, as I mentioned earlier, you can go service to self and just and you know do selfish things. You can be service to other and make sure what you do benefits others work with wealth, death and rebirth, transformation. And uh, I did a lot of reading in preparation for this presentation. And I just wanna mention some of the books I recommend if you wanna dive deeper into all this. If you wanna read an incredible book on how social media algorithms radicalize their users, there's a new book called The Chaos Machine, the inside story of how social media rewired our minds and our world. It's by Max Fisher. He writes for the New York Times. And the articles he wrote in preparation for this book, got him nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And he's a great writer and the content is just riveting, in my opinion. Um, so how do you not get sucked down that rabbit hole if you're on social media and who's not on social media, right? So I believe if you maintain embodied awakening as strongly and consistently as possible, that's really good. Um, again, in my Awakening Plus membership and in my book, I talk how you can use a very simple tool to maintain embodied awakening, which means your higher self merges with your human self and you have this consciousness that is in, but sort of is above at the same time, your human self. When you hold that divine awareness, it's a whole lot harder to get sucked down the rabbit holes. So um, you're less easily manipulated. So uh, whatever, whether you use my technique for that or any of the other tools that are out there, there's lots of great ways to hold awakening. Uh, staying awake is more important than ever, in my opinion. Other books that I read for this presentation that I found very engaging and stimulating, um, a one called an author, Peter Zeihan, Z-E-I-H-A-N, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. Uh, last year, I mentioned this book by Ray Dalio called Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. Still a big fan of that one. Barbara F. Walter wrote this wonderful book called How Civil Wars Start. Uh, Moises Niam wrote an amazing book called The Revenge of Power, How Autocrats Are Reinventing Politics for the 21st Century. And Timothy Snyder wrote a great evergreen book called On Tyranny. So all very relevant books for our time. I believe I have time to just hit the key highlights of the most important new nations of the year. We're gonna just whip these out. I'm not gonna interpret each one in full, just the most highlights. Here on January 21st, 2023, we have a new moon around two degrees Aquarius. Here we have the sun and moon conjunct Pluto. And this is powerful for unique and revolutionary beginnings. On February 5th, we have a full moon 
moons in Leo. And on this one, I'm really excited to hear about the fact that Uranus is squaring the sun and moon. Kind of carries forward what we had in the first lunation because the first one was a new moon in Aquarius. And I've been talking endlessly about Aquarius on this presentation. So not only do you have this powerful, new, authentic, different new beginnings, even the full moon following with Uranus square says, you know, make whatever adjustments or releases you need to, to again, do the Uranus thing to express your uniqueness into the world, to follow your intuitive hits and to serve others with your special gifts and talents. After that, this one's really simple. We've got a Pisces new moon. Uh, the only significant thing in my opinion is that Saturn is super close to the sun and moon. And this is really, well, it's really great for law of attraction, embodied awakening, and uh, even conscious dissolution. So that one's pretty simple. Next, Aries new moon on March 21st. The new moon's in the very first degree of Aries, which is powerful for starting. Um, this is incredible for new starts, communication and abundance. Uh, communication, because we have the sun and moon conjunct Mercury. They're also square Mars, which is in Gemini. Mercury and uh, Gemini are both about communication. In fact, uh, if you're a little deeper into astrology, you can see that Mars and Mercury in mutual reception there, firing each other up. And abundance is because we get that Pisces Neptune, um, visualization, imagination, conjunct all that fire it up, make it happen energy of the sun and moon in Aries. After that, we've got a Libra full moon on April 6th. And this is really good for relationship healing, breakthroughs, uh, and healing and mentoring in general. And that's all because that uh, Libra moon is right across from Chiron, the wounded healer archetype. After that, we have our first eclipse of the year, an Aries solar eclipse on April 20th. And this is pretty amazing. Not only is it an eclipse, which is like way more powerful than a standard lunation and eclipses, you can work with those for like six months after they happen. Um, We've got the, the sun and moon almost exactly square Pluto, which is like a supercharger. Also, the sun and moon are pretty close to the north node. And that makes the, the more close the sun and moon are to the node, the more powerful the eclipse can be. So this is good for ultra powerful new starts and energizing aligned with your life purpose, which is lunar nodes. Next, we have a Scorpio lunar eclipse on May 5th. And here we have the Scorpio moon opposing Uranus. There's a Scorpio moon there at 15 Scorpio and Uranus right across from it. This is good for a big change fast and breakthrough shadow work. Next, that's called an envelope. And this is May 19. It's a Taurus new moon. We're back to regular lunations again. So this uh, has the sun and moon tied in with those three outer planets. This is sort of, it's not quite time for that mini grand trine to be effective unto itself, but like the, the luminaries kind of aspecting all three of them sort of gives it a premature energizing, if you will. So this therefore is supportive given that the sun and moon are in Taurus. When you put all these energies together, because we're short on time, I'm just gonna kind of hit the keywords here. This is good for abundance, law of attraction, embodied awakening and creative productivity. Next, there's a Gemini new moon on June 18. And there's a tight T square with the luminaries and Neptune and Ceres. So this is good to replace any mental confusion you might be having with intuitive knowing. Intuitive knowing is better than mental, I promise you. Also, this this Gemini new moon on June 18 is good for soul level connection with committed partnership because look at the sun and moon right there next to Juno. Looks like a cross with a bad hair day. That's the asteroid goddess of committed partnership. However, there's a caution here too with all of its square Neptune. Watch out for gaslighting. Committed partnership doesn't have to be romantic. It could be any close connection you have. And while this could be a profound soul level connection with someone, if they have malicious intent or are just diluted, then they could gaslight you. So watch out for that under that Gemini new moon on June 18. Then we've got a Cancer new moon on July 17. This is forming a grand cross with Pluto and the lunar nodes. 
Uh, when the luminaries are at a right angle to the nodes, we say they're at the bending of the nodes is the technical term for that. So this, you can let your heart with the sun and moon in cancer, let your heart lead you into potently aligning with your soul purpose. That's the lunar node square. And this is great for shadow work with Pluto involved. In the process, feel all your emotions completely and transform your behavior within family relationships, also represented by cancer for highest good. Then Virgo new moon on September 14th. And this forms a kite. There's another of those kites I talked about earlier. Uh, again, this is the one pattern that involves those three outer planets, uh, Uranus, uh, Neptune and Pluto and the mini grand trine when they're already active into a lunation. And this overall can give harmonious empowerment of service, health and precision because the luminaries are in Virgo. And it also fires up the effect of that mini grand trine because the sun and moon are feeding them energy. Then we have a Libra solar eclipse on October 14th involves Mercury, the lunar nodes, Pluto and Chiron. That's pretty strong and intense. So this solar eclipse is really good for shadow work, mentoring and communication. And with that Uranus quincunx, that 150 degree aspect, you can get breakthroughs by making the right adjustments in any of those areas. And a lunar eclipse in Taurus. And under this one, you can learn, communicate and broadcast. And why do I say that? Because on, on both sides of the luminaries, I've got the moon conjunct Jupiter, I've got the sun conjunct Mercury. And those are the two communication planets. Uh, why would it be a transformational message? Because the Sun and Mercury and Mars are all in Scorpio, which is the sign of transformation. You can also use this Taurus lunar eclipse on October 28th to transform limited ways of thinking. You can increase hope and happiness by releasing physically or verbally abusive situations. Why would I say that? Because I've got Mercury and Mars together in Scorpio and the Sun in Scorpio that has on the dark side abusive potential. So step away from any such relationships if they cannot be healed. And then we got, I think, one more. Yep, this is the last one. Scorpio new moon on November 13th. And here we've got the sun and moon tightly conjunct Mars and right across from Uranus, pretty strong. So this one, another powerful new start breakthrough opportunity with all that Scorpio and Mars energy, more great potential for um, sacred sex and that sort of thing if you wanna get into that. And that is my presentation. So we can now open it up for questions. So if you're here on the live event, you can now unmute yourself and speak. You're also welcome to type in the chat. I, I like live interaction though, so I will give, uh, here's Greg. Hi, hey, Greg, what's your question? Hi, Benjamin. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to I, I, to do these, uh, you know, full year uh, elaborate uh, discussions just take so much work. And I thank you so much for for putting that time in to help us, uh, you know, prepare for the coming year. So thank you about that. You're, you're welcome. Um, I, I just had a question. You had mentioned that there was going to be a trine between Pluto and Uranus. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I don't see that because we're talking about, you know, Uranus right now is like retrograding. I think it, it stations at like 1456 Taurus uh -huh. and Uranus is, you know, Pluto is going to go and station at 0021 Aquarius. Mm -hmm. uh, so so how are you? First of all, to me, it's a square by, um, isn't it? Isn't it? Am, I, am I missing something there? It's a, it would be a square by... Um, um, by sign, by archetypal sign, but but where was the trine that you said? Or did I did I misunderstand you? No, you did I write that down? Okay. So I can't get up the graphic, but basically I'm using mundane orbs. Let me let me explain that. So um, if you read the book uh, Cosmos and Psyche by Richard Tarnas, he suggests using much bigger orbs when you're looking at just sky events, and I'm using ten degrees for a trine. And therefore, if you when you actually get Pluto coming into Aquarius in March of 2023, and you actually look at where Uranus is, they Uranus are is within be, 10. Yeah, I, I, they are within it's 10. It's going to be after 20 time. degree. I got you. It's going to be like yeah. 20 degrees exactly, or something of Taurus. I got you. Okay, yeah. that's what I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, thank you for that. Thank you You're so welcome. much. You're welcome. Good question. I love astrologically savvy questions. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Um, hi. I noticed uh, 
I, I couldn't go far enough back to uh, to the last time that there was uh, this particular configuration of uh, Pluto and, and and Neptune and Uranus, but mm -hmm. there was a uh, a mini grand trine involving these planets, but with Pluto rather than Neptune at the uh, sort of at the, the center of the mini grand trine. Mm -hmm. And that occurred right in the middle of World War II, like yes. 1942 to 44. Do, mm -hmm. do you want to like sort of talk about that energy? Yeah, and, and, and when, I was, when I was researching last year, I saw that too. And I found that to be of great concern. And without pulling up the chart, here's, here's the deal. During that period, there was a Uranus Saturn square. And I asked Eric Myers about that. And he said, because of the Uranus Saturn square, that was the big deal that led to the world war astrologically. Um, there also, I noted, he didn't mention it, but later in the, the world war II period, Chiron came in there and was in the midst of all that too. And Chiron's wounded healing and trauma. So all that together, was the violent stuff. In this case, as we get into this decade, we don't have the Saturn square that could be that problematical that way. So um, because of the absence of Saturn square Uranus, which is historically a very difficult situation, that's why I'm thinking we're more likely to have a harmonious outcome here as opposed to more global conflict. Is that a helpful answer, Ted? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Great questions. I have oh. another question. If you don't mind, you had a you have the mini grand trine. Uh, the United States is going to go through a Chiron return as well as Uranus mm -hmm. return during that time. And yep. I was wondering if you know the United States, including for the Revolutionary War, has always been at war. You know, we were born out of war. Not every country is born out of war. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, have you factored in in your thinking about how that Chiron return and that Uranus return might play into that mini grand trine that's supposed to be, or hopefully anyway, so harmonious? Yeah, I studied all that. There just wasn't time to put it on this presentation. A Chiron return usually involves some kind of wounding or trauma. And frankly, we're having it right now, you know, and we're not quite at the Chiron return yet. We'll have that. I think that's in about a year when that comes in and lasts about two years. So um, when anyone, a country or a person has a Chiron return, you're going to get triggered. Your old unhealed traumas are going to come up like they are with our country. You know, one thing Trump did was he really brought up the, um, the 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 white working class people who are his main followers are saying we're being disempowered we used to have a good middle class living and now we're suffering we're difficult we're being replaced and of course they're angry about that so trump kind of stirred that up and our country needs to realize yes we need to give equality to people of color and things like that we also need to take care of all these other people so the question is will our country heal itself and give the support that all the citizens need rather than favoring some and discarding others, in my opinion, would be a great way to approach the current return so we get healing instead of just additional trauma. And I'm just hoping that enough people are conscious enough to want healing as opposed to getting sucked down the social media rabbit holes I was talking about and getting stuck into us versus them conflict mentalities. Uh, the Uranus return is a fabulous time to reinvent. You know, everything I said about Uranus um, you know, if, if it's embraced constantly, we can accept what's unique. We can, you know, be inspired. You know, we can be electrified and get all sorts of great intuitive hits as a national entity for the better if we're good about this. Also, if we're not as conscious, Uranus returns can be chaotic and destabilizing and crazy making. So, you know, the, the energies are not inherently good or bad either way. It's what the individual or the collective chooses to do with the energies. And that's why I'm such a huge fan of each of us being as awake, as peaceful, as conscious as we can, because then we feed energy into the matrix of the country and the world and make it a little bit more likely that we'll get a better outcome. So I think each one of us and what we do has a huge impact on the collective. Is Thanks that a helpful so answer? Yeah, no, thank you. Benjamin, I have a question going back to the Pluto-Uranus uh, conjunction in the 60s and uh -huh. how that what was it, seven passes of the square between them uh, in the 2010s? We had something like seven passes of the square. Okay. Um, and that, I think, was reflecting when we saw the beginnings of Trump, 
And we mm -hmm. also saw more of the financial collapse, the outcomes of the financial collapse. I'm wondering if the trine, because if we need to mine our trines, right. um, gives us an opportunity to come back to what was attempted at the beginning uh, in, during the conjunction with perhaps a little more success, because there seems to have been this perpetual backlash against what occurred in the 60s or what was attempted to surface in the 60s around women's rights, um, mm -hmm. you name it. But generally, the movement forward, mm -hmm. um, do you think that we're going to see some of that? Now, to be honest, this is a trine, which is helpful and can be mined consciously, as you say, but it doesn't guarantee the kind of powerful effect that we have if the planets were conjoining or opposing or in square right angle to each other. So normally a trine connection is not naturally strong enough to have a big global impact, but we can consciously use it to some degree, in my opinion. Uh, but historically, what we see is the big changes happen in a country or in a, in a world when there's conjunctions, oppositions, or squares more than when there's soft aspects. Got now, it. an exception would be, I think this mini grand trine might be an exception because it is so rare for the three outers to be aligned so tightly like they are. And to me, that is a really beautiful multi-year opportunity to become a more harmonious culture globally. But again, we'll just, you know, each of us individually does it and we'll increase the odds that it'll happen collectively. That's all I can say. If I, if I can ask a follow-up, one of the things that shifted was in the I mean, obviously it was Reagan um, in the in the early 80s, but uh, the tax structure within the U.S. was what caused a lot of what we're seeing right now in terms of the concentration mm -hmm. of wealth. Um, and I think some of that had that Pluto-Saturn-Uranus conjunction, uh, what was Pluto-Uranus conjunction opposite Saturn in the 60s mm -hmm. yes. that teed that up. Um, and given that we're coming out of Pluto and Capricorn, usually there's Pluto and Capricorn came in with financial collapse. Are we likely to see perhaps a more forward-looking collapse this time? In other words, when it falls apart, we actually can knit it together better than we did back in 2008 when this shenanigans started? Uh, I'm not qualified to speak at that level, but I would hope so. I just finished a book by a well-known global uh, forecaster. And um, forgive me, I can't recall the book title or the author just at this very moment, even though I just read it. But he says there's both a 50 and an 80 year cycle at work in the US and both cycles are hitting here in the 2020s. Mm. And so um, he says we're just coming to the very end of that, that period that started with Reagan, with him sort of remaking the economic realities of the world. And he says what happens is we'll have people try to maintain that it collapses, it doesn't work. And then just because what we tried is not working, a new president has to come in with a new economic vision and start the next new thing. So he says, we're coming to the end of that Reagan cycle and he can't predict exactly what the new cycle will be, but he says, historically, we'll expect something quite different as far as the financial approach would be. Very good. Thank you so much for this. You're welcome. I have a question. Okay. Go ahead. I had a near-death experience in fall of 2016, was told that since I stayed, I was here to help people get through the difficult time to transition time afterward. You know, the Kali Yuga, the Hindu predictions, Kabbalistic predictions. Um, I'm getting really tired and I'm wondering <laughs> when there's going to be some relief. Wow. I, I, I'm afraid that I can't speak to your individual reality. No, um, no, I, I mean cosmically. I don't mean for me. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Earth is designed for that. That's actually a metaphysical question I wonder about sometimes. I'm not sure that we're ever supposed to have a true golden age here on 3D Earth, or if Earth is designed to be difficult to give soul certain experiences, and then we get the more peaceful experience once we graduate human and getting to the next level of evolution. Because my understanding is you know, being human is not even a fraction of the way through the soul's journey. There's a whole lot of stuff beyond here that goes on for billions of years after you graduate being a human. So it's possible the more peaceful realities are beyond that. Um, if the law of one material is correct, what you would want to do is in this lifetime, be a little bit more service to other than self-serving, a little more concerned with others than yourself. And if you genuinely accomplish that, then you graduate after this lifetime, and then you can move on to those more peaceful levels. So if their, their information is correct, then that would be a strategy to accomplish that. 
So there's a ray of hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was counting on that one. I just <laughs> <laughs> I do hospice work and I'm always saying, yeah, it's going to be great. Just relax. Thanks. Now, even having said all that, it's possible that, you know, the Aquarian age paradise we'd all love to live in might or might not be achievable here in 3D Earth. However, it might be. I don't know. I'm not going to rule out the possibility at all. And one thing I'm going to say for sure is that we can each live it individually, even if the collective hasn't caught up. My own experience has been since I've been able to establish and hold embodied awakening consistently, my own reality has become much rosier, much more harmonious and peaceful, and much more like that Aquarian age vibe we'd all love to have personally. And I know many others who also it's pretty predictable if someone gets into their embodied awakening and can hold that consistently their experience becomes much more like the aquarian age that we'd all love to have so um whether or not we get to it collectively matters less than you getting to it individually again this is not selfish i get it they don't it's about you saying i need to establish it myself which increases the odds of everybody else getting it the uh, people of transcendental meditation years ago did experiments where they'd have thousands of people in a hotel meditating in a large city and they'd measure the crime rates i think typically the crime rate in a big city would drop like 30 percent during the days when they were doing these 24 7 meditations so um they've proven the effect of a lot of people holding a different state of consciousness if enough of us can hold this consistently enough then maybe we will get this aquarian age maybe the law of one is not correct and we actually can get that amazing aquarian age here on planet earth here in 3d i would love it if that happened i don't know what the truth is the odds increase um, if you do the personal awakening and hold peacefulness within yourself and if it can be achieved then that's going to make it much more possible for the collective as well so I hope that clarifies that point. So that's all the time for questions. Y'all have been such wonderful audience. Thanks for bearing with me and asking such great questions here at the end. Let me just remind people again that I do have uh, things that I would love them to check out. So as a reminder, I have the book, um, Instant Divine Assistance, Your Complete Guide to Fast and Easy Spiritual Awakening, Healing and More. It's an Amazon bestseller. It's got 55 five-star reviews as of right now. and um, you can check that out on Amazon. Uh, the ebook is only $2.99 if you want to check that out. Uh, I have the This Week in Astrology podcast. I do that every twice a month, despite the name. And uh, you can hear my forecasting there. Uh, my new podcast is called Awaken, Heal, and Thrive, where I get into uh, spiritual, well, you know, how to awaken, how to heal, how to thrive. And we come out every week on that. And then my Awakening Plus membership at awakeningplus.com. If you like my vibe, uh, come into there. There's a growing structure there to support your awakening, your healing, and your thriving. Thanks again for being here.